place and time where logic breaks down and wonderment begins? Could that be somewhere or sometime along an indefinable line between the reasonable and the highly unlikely? Makeshift Stories presents a monthly journey into the improbable. Today's story, episode 208, Precognition. Read and recorded by Mitchell Two. Audio editing and post-production by Matthew Erdman. Somewhere in some time, even a hardened skeptic might begin to question their grasp on reality. Monday, January 27th, time, 1.32 p.m. Test method. A sealed box containing several items is placed on the table about 70 centimeters from the subject. My assistant has prepared the box, so I have no idea what is in it. She has also been careful not to contact the subject, and in fact does not know who my patient is. The subject, one Arjun Dar, does not know who selected the items or what they are. Further, my assistant made a list of the items in the test boxes, sealed the list in an envelope, then handed it to our accountant before the commencement of the testing. This prevents me from giving the subject involuntary clues as to the identity of the objects and ensures the subject and my assistant have not somehow colluded. Done as a matter of pro forma in tests such as these, I have isolated the subject in a room which blocks all radio signals. I'm starting the recorder, Arjun. Let me know if you are not okay with that. I need to remind you, you cannot touch the box. Please concentrate on its contents. Take your time and try to tell me what's in it. Okay. Um... Give me a second. I... I... I want to say there are two... No, I... I think there are three. No, I was right the first time. No, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm getting a fuzzy image. Um, One is rectangular, like a book or something. I can't read the title, but it's a paperback. I'm pretty sure. The corners are starting to curl like it's been read many times. Also, there's something laying across it that's, uh, I can't read the title. Why? I, I think it's, hmm, okay, I can see it now. It's a feather duster. Like one you'd use to clean the top of a cabinet with a handle. I, I don't see anything else, so I guess there are only two objects. Something is making this difficult. I can't concentrate enough to get a better read. All right, Arjun, that's great. It's a good start. I'm going to stop recording now. Did I get it right? Based on the condition of his clothes, I guessed he had been sleeping in them, if he had been sleeping at all. He had chronic insomnia, which contributed to his degrading health, and was one of the reasons he had been referred to me. You know I can't tell you, Arjun. It would bias the results, I explained. I don't know why you keep doing these stupid tests, he protested absent-mindedly scratching at a dry patch of skin on his forearm. I keep telling you, I have ESP. It sticks to me like a monkey on my back. I hate it. He was looking agitated, so I needed to be careful. This was an extremely sensitive point. Arjun was convinced of his special paranormal aptitude. I just want to confirm the extent of your abilities, so we can determine where to go from here. I know this may seem tedious, but it's necessary. Please, bear with me a bit longer, Arjun. I gently urged him. I am a clinical psychologist, specializing in cognitive behavioral therapy. Arjun had been referred to me through a veteran's support program. His belief in his so-called powers created great anxiety and stress, and at the time, I suspected were the root cause of his insomnia. Arjun's military record included a significant stint in a special intelligence unit which dabbled in remote viewing, telekinesis, and experimental drugs. I had been certain this experience somehow aggravated a pre-existing propensity for delusion and paranoia. 
His reasons for leaving were unclear and didn't explain why he would have symptoms similar to PTSD. As far as Arjun's records were concerned, he worked in an office, but his specific duties were redacted in the documents I received, and Arjun was unwilling to talk about his time there. So I decided to prove to him he wasn't psychic and had nothing to fear. I felt his almost desperate desire to be normal was a good start. Statistically, in the black box test, he had been getting slightly more right than random chance would predict, but only by a fraction of a percentage. This had happened in other controlled ESP studies, and nothing conclusive was drawn from them. The results were explained away by errors in methodology. I knew he had read the studies as well, and I was concerned he would consider even a tiny deviation from random chance a confirmation of his abilities. We were only halfway through the series, and I hoped for a clearer result at the end. We have twelve more tests. Are you willing to continue, Arjun? I asked, noting his reactions carefully. He just shrugged and leaned back in his chair before responding. You're only going to find out what all the army shrinks concluded, he taunted. And what's that, Arjun? That I have special abilities. And these special abilities are psychic. I really don't see the point in this, Doctor. But if it will help convince you, sure, I'm willing to keep going. I'm happy you're willing to continue, but let's call it a day. I'll get my assistant to book you in again for one tomorrow. Is that okay? That'll work, he confirmed. I watched him get up and leave. His rumpled clothes hung too loosely on his frame. He wasn't eating enough, and that was concerning. Tuesday, January 28th, time 1.20 p.m. Arjun was late, and I wondered if he had decided not to continue when the door to the testing room swung open. He looked even more tired than yesterday, if that was possible. Sorry I'm late. I, uh, I had trouble sleeping. The dream is back, he explained hesitantly. It's okay, Arjun. Please, take a seat. Let's start with the dream. I want to record this. Is that okay with you? Arjun nodded his consent and settled, kneading his hands. I noticed he had bitten his nails down to the pink. The recorder is on. Please, tell me about the dream. Uh, I don't... I don't remember all of it. That's fine. Just tell me what you can. He made a great show of squirming around to get comfortable and continued to knead his hands. I pretended not to notice. Anything will help, even a vague impression, I encouraged. Uh, I, uh... I was smothering. No, it was more like drowning. It was dark and freezing. So cold. My hands were numb. I couldn't feel my fingers. The coldness, it started to fill my lungs, choking me. I, I couldn't breathe. My hands were like clubs. I was banging them against a metal wall, trying to escape, but it was pointless. Flesh against steel, I couldn't break through. I was trapped. Then I woke up. Sorry, that's all I can recall. You said the dream was back, so you've had it before. Arjun nodded, then looked at the door. I was sure he was checking to make sure it wasn't locked. Almost every time I try to sleep, so I avoid sleep as much as I can. I, I thought it had gone away. I hadn't had it for a few weeks. This is the first time since I started seeing you. It's why I haven't mentioned it before. How long have you been having this dream? I asked, suspecting I already knew the answer. Since I left the service. This is important information, Arjun. I wish you had told me about it earlier. What did you do in the service? Your record doesn't say much. 
Were you a researcher or a subject? Did they give you drugs to make you hallucinate? It would account for the dream. Arjun just stared into space. This would be a lot easier, Arjun, if you just gave me more information. He turned and looked at me, eyes seeing through me as if I wasn't there. He was someplace else. Then, suddenly, he was back, the moment of whatever it was evaporating. Arjun looked down at his hands and realized for the first time he was needing them, and immediately stopped. Let's get on with the test, doctor. Fine, I agreed, tamping down my frustration. You know the rules. You can't touch the box. He exhaled, and I smelt stale cigarettes and made a mental note that he'd started smoking again. Arjun passed his hands over the box on the table for a while, then balled his hands into fists and pressed them against his temples. It's a trope so-called stage psychics use to show concentration, and I had to catch myself before I laughed. Oh, this one is totally different. It's, uh, uh there's, oh, I don't know, it's a pile, sort of a pyramid shape. Um, but it's got no flat sides, so it's a pile, not quite smooth, loose stuff, something like dirt. It's a pile of sand, he concluded. Is there anything else? Uh, uh, no. Sorry, doctor, I've lost it. That's all I got. No problem, it's great. I've stopped the recording. Do you want to talk more about the dream or your work in the services? No, he responded with absolute certainty. I pressed the stop button on the tablet and found myself missing the solid, reassuring feedback of a mechanical button. Monday, February 15th, time 2.30 p.m. It was the last of the black box tests. We'd done a total of 25. The twice-weekly testing had given me the opportunity to slowly peel back some of Arjun's resistance. For example, he finally admitted he was a subject rather than a researcher in the intelligence unit he had been assigned to. Apparently, he was chosen from a group of randomly tested military personnel based on some type of scoring system for ESP potential. He also admitted the unit was interested in combining remote viewing with psychokinesis. Based on the information Arjun provided, I had done some research and believed he may have been part of a project codenamed Sunstreak, and later Stargate, which included the participation of several government security agencies, along with a private, non-profit, known for its research into psychic phenomena. Since Arjun had started opening up about that part of his life, his repeating nightmare had become less frequent, supporting my theory that Arjun's problems were connected to something he had experienced during his time in the intelligence unit. Although he continued to deny it, I still suspected he had been given experimental hallucinogens, which had permanently affected him. Hi, Arjun. It's our last test today. Are you ready? He seemed relatively calm and had changed his clothes and shaved. Both good signs. Okay, I'm starting the recording. Let me know if you have any objections. He did his usual thing with his hands over the box, before pressing them to the sides of his head. However, he took longer than usual and grimaced more. I suppose to indicate he was having some trouble. Ah, uh, it's... It's, uh, before there was something. Uh, I don't know. I'm seeing, uh, uh... I'm just seeing darkness. Can you be more specific? I encouraged... There is, uh, I'll try, uh, there's a blackness, uh, maybe a, a void, I'm, I'm not seeing anything, there's nothing to see, nothing at all, it's just blank, like an empty blackboard. He smiled and seemed to relax. My mind is totally blank, there are no images. That's fine, Arjun. I'll mark it empty in the sheet. Are you fine with that? 
He nodded enthusiastically. Good. Then, would you like to talk about anything else today? Maybe more about your intelligence work? Ah, uh, no. Although he was still resisting, I intuitively felt he was close to a critical breakthrough. Do you know anything about Project Sunstreak? Were you part of it? He stiffened and squirmed. That was as good as a yes for me. Can I go now? He requested, getting suddenly antsy. Okay, I'll have the results back next week, and we can meet to discuss them. I was confident the tests would reveal nothing, so we could finally put this ESP nonsense to rest and get down to the real work. Wednesday, February 24th, time 10 a.m. To ensure complete objectivity on my part, I had a colleague run the results. As I suspected, the number of correct hits Arjun made were not above what would be expected by random chance, but rather than tell him, I printed out a spreadsheet. The first column showed the actual contents, the second, his guesses. I wanted him to see it and come to the obvious conclusion himself. Sitting across the conference room table from me, Arjun looked confident and relaxed for once. Here. I've printed out a report. The first column is the box contents. The second is what you saw. I placed the paper on the table in front of him. Tell me what you think. He took his time, running a finger down the rows, periodically stopping to cross-check the columns until he reached the end. Yep. It's... it's what I expected, he noted calmly. Can you lend me a pen or something to write? His response was not what I had expected. Curious to see what he would do, I handed him a yellow marker. He immediately started drawing arrows between the columns. When he was done, he turned the paper around so I could see his handiwork and smiled. Just like I thought, I got most of them right. He beamed. You just need to align my responses to the correct test. You see, doctor, my ability to envision hidden things doesn't work in the current time frame. I can only see into the future. Sometimes I'll see the contents of the next box. Sometimes it's a week or two after. It's not an exact skill. I picked up the paper and followed the arrows he had drawn connecting the cells. But what about the last test? You said you saw nothing, I noted. I guessed the contents a week ago. Look. He reached over and traced one of the arrows with his forefinger. There was nothing in the future for me to see, and that could only mean I won't be doing any more tests like this, which is great. I'm tired of having to prove my powers to people. So, you claim you can see into the future? Yes, this is what happens every time I take a test like this. The results look random until you account for the time offset. And there's more. I can also make changes to the future which affect the present. The scientists in the program called it retrocausation or something. They were extremely interested in it. I suddenly felt we were getting to the heart of the matter. All I needed to do was gently prod him in the right direction. And you're afraid you've done something to the future which is going to have a negative effect. He nodded, burying his head in his hands. Can you tell me about it? I don't know. It's classified. But all the records from Stargate were publicly released a few years ago. Not everything, he insisted. Not this. Are you sure? All the records were destroyed. They couldn't afford to have them leaked. It was very sensitive and had potential international repercussions. That was the crux I had been expecting, a neat wrinkle in his story, which would make it unverifiable. Regardless, we needed to get at this imagined event. To move on, to put your past behind you, you need to finally talk about it, Arjun. He chewed his lower lip, considering. Why don't you think about it for a few days? I'll book a session next week. He sat and stared at his hands for a while, then finally nodded. March 4th, 2 p.m. 
Arjun didn't show up, and I was concerned I may have lost him. My assistant had left messages on his cell. We rebooked for the next week. In the meantime, I did some checking on retro causality and got over 15,000 search results when combined with the keyword ESP. Of course, it's highly debated. I tend to support the overwhelming number of skeptics. Retro causality implies a deterministic universe where the future is already decided, which implies humans do not have free will. It makes more sense that the future is the result of the choices we make today, that actions come before the effects, not the reverse. However, retro causality does apparently exist in quantum mechanics, but then again, so does being in two places at once. Neither work at the macro level and both are frequently borrowed by pseudoscientific theories about the paranormal. Arjun eventually texted us. He apologized for missing his appointment, claiming his cell phone died, and agreed to come in on March 15th, his choice of the date. It was the Ides of March, notable to the Romans as a deadline for settling debts, and notoriously the assassination of Julius Caesar. I found it all too easy to assign significance to his choice and needed to prod myself to maintain objectivity. March 15th, 2.30 p.m. I decided not to record the session, so Arjun would be more willing to open up. The following is my recollection of the encounter and the events which followed. Thanks for agreeing to come back, Arjun. I believe if you can get past this point and talk about what happened, it will put you well on the road to recovery. I'm still not sure about this. I need to confirm you'll keep this confidential. Of course, I would never break doctor-patient confidentiality. Anything said in this room will remain between you and I. Although, I suppose in recounting these events, I have broken my word. Arjun thought about it for a while, then deflated into his chair. Okay, then. Ah... Uh... I know you don't believe I have special powers, but I want you to suspend your disbelief just for a bit and listen. He was right. I don't believe in paranormal pseudoscience, and even now I question what actually happened that day. I'm pragmatic. I've seen too many patients construct false worlds around them to make sense of their broken lives, and they all had an unshakable faith in their personal fiction. Belief is one of the strongest forces in the human mind. Sometimes I can help a patient overcome a false perception, and sometimes I can't. It's, uh, it's the dream. It's something I did. You see, uh, I, uh, I was recruited because of my special sensitivities. It wasn't for the Sunstreak program. It didn't even have a name. They put me through all the standard ESP tests, and at first, they thought I didn't possess any special powers, until one researcher realized I was seeing into the future, not the present. They also discovered I could do a unique form of telekinesis. Like I told you, when I see someplace in the future, I'm actually there, and I, I can reach out and interact with things, like... Uh, like I can move things around and affect the present. Uh, it's uh, kind of hard to explain. Like, if I envisioned this office in the future and moved your computer to the other side of the desk, then you or a cleaning person would be compelled to shift it there in the present, and you wouldn't know I had manipulated you from the future. At first, they had me do small tasks, like shift the location of objects in an office, or a few words in a report, or news stories. Somehow, word got out, and one day we were visited by another agency. They wanted my help. They had intelligence reports about a stealth Russian submarine operating in Arctic waters just off the northern coast. It was submerged in a bay near one of our secret bases, intercepting radio communications. Ah, uh, it was... Their idea. They wanted to force it to the surface to embarrass Moscow and make it look like an accident. They had satellite images and charts showing the path of icebergs just outside the bay. Uh, but 
They didn't understand. I mean, didn't understand the complexity involved, and back then neither did I. I was convinced I could do anything, so I agreed to try. I'm humbler now, more aware of my limitations and the risks involved. Arjun stopped to take a drink of water. They identified an iceberg which was currently passing close to the entrance of the bay the sub was in. They showed me its projected path a week into the future. I, um, I changed it. I imagined it in a slightly different place. Just enough off course, or so we thought, so it would block the bay entrance and trap the sub. Uh, there are so many factors. Wind, sea currents, it's just too many factors, you see. I could never be that accurate. I'm not a computer, and my impressions of the future are just that. Impressions, not high-resolution photos with GPS coordinates. Almost immediately, the people from the other agencies started getting messages on their phones. The berg had entered the bay, and the sub had collided with it. All hands were lost. I've never heard of an incident like that. It would have been all over the news. No. Think about it, Doctor. The Russians would never admit they had a sub that far in our territorial waters. Conversely, if our culpability was ever leaked, it was at the height of the arms race. So all the documentation was destroyed, and they determined retrocausation was too unpredictable to be of any strategic use. I had the first nightmare that night, then quit the program as soon as I could. You see, it's not a dream, Doctor. I'm actually experiencing the last moment of some poor, doomed submariner's life over and over and over. It's like a film loop I can't turn off. I, I, I wanted to change things back. I pleaded with them before I resigned, but they wouldn't show me the charts and satellite photos again. They weren't prepared to risk an even worse outcome. I sat for a minute, running scenarios through my mind. How was I going to convince this man he was not responsible for some imagined tragedy? An idea came to me. I want to prove to you if there was an accident, it was just that, an accident, which would have happened anyway. No, I won't, he began to object. Please, hear me out. I pulled up the local news feed on my tablet and scrolled through the stories until I found what I wanted. There's a car accident. It just happened. The driver died. His name and photo are at the bottom of this article. I want you to reach into the future and envision him alive. I want you to try and prevent the accident. But there's, there's so many unknown consequences I, I can't control. Arjun, if I'm right, then you are not responsible for the death of that submarine crew, and if I'm wrong, you'll save someone's life today. It's not that simple. The ripple back in time is unpredictable. March 4th, 4.15pm. Arjun was reluctant, but eventually agreed to the experiment. I watched him concentrate on the dead driver's photo, then close his eyes and frown until he relaxed his face and said it had been done. I had to admit, his performance was commensurate with the best stage mentalist. He insisted, and I know for a fact he believed, it was a potentially dangerous endeavor. As agreed, we started to walk over to the accident site to confirm whether Arjun had changed events in the present. According to the traffic reports, just before his little performance, the site hadn't been cleared. I wanted him to see that nothing had changed, that the debris from the accident was still there, and the speeding, distracted driver was still quite dead from jumping a meridian and crashing into a concrete barrier. Most importantly, I wanted him to realize he wasn't psychic, and he wasn't responsible for the sinking of a submarine 20 years ago. Arjun was edgy as we came up to a major intersection a block away from the crash site. He looked around like a frightened rabbit ready to run in the opposite direction. We waited for the light to turn in our favor, then started across the street. 
Halfway there, out of the corner of one eye, I noticed a large SUV wasn't stopping. I turned toward it, and suddenly recognized both the vehicle and the face behind the wheel, checking something on the seat beside them, instead of watching the road. It couldn't be, the rational part of my brain insisted. The driver was dead, the wreckage of the truck a block away. A person couldn't change events by imagining a different future. But both were careening toward me, mocking my fact-based view of the world. I tried to run, but I reacted too slowly as the massive chrome grill barreled down on me, and I instinctively braced for the pain of impact. Suddenly, I felt myself being pushed from behind. I hit the warm asphalt like a flailing baby bird, pushed from its nest for the first time, and rolled onto my back. Arjun was tossed into the air after being hit. He rolled across the hood and smashed into the windshield, then rebounded into a light standard like a rag doll. He didn't look surprised. Rather, his expression was one of resignation and peace as he flopped dead onto the ground. Shift Stories is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. To listen to other great APN podcasts such as I Have Some Notes, where hosts Greg Beaver, Liam Creswick, and Scott C. Bourgeois punch up a mediocre Hollywood movie, head over to albertapodcastnetwork.com. This episode of Makeshift Stories is brought to you by ATB. Today, I want to tell you about ATB's new podcast, The Future Of. Join Todd Hirsch, ATB's Vice President and Chief Economist, as he connects with special guests who offer unique and useful perspectives about the future. Explore how our economy and communities can not only brace for change, but embrace the opportunity it creates. From the future of women in business to the changing nature of work itself, The Future Of helps us understand what's coming and what we need to do today to get the tomorrow we want. Featuring two episodes each month, plus bonus episodes, The Future Of includes interviews with top community and business leaders from Alberta and around the world. Subscribe to The Future Of in the Apple Store, Google Play, Spotify, and everywhere podcasts are found, and connect to ask your questions about the future by emailing thefutureof at atb.com. Makeshift Stories is brought to you by Park Power, your friendly local utilities provider in Alberta. Offering internet, electricity, and natural gas with low rates, awesome service, and profit sharing with local charities. In Alberta, you get to choose who to buy your internet, electricity, and natural gas from. If you choose Park Power, you are choosing a positive local business. Plus, Park Power shares its profits with local not-for-profits that are working to make a difference for their communities. Shopping local is very important to Park Power's owner, Chris Kozowski, and we love local here at the Alberta Podcast Network, so it's a great fit. Learn more at parkpower.ca. Makeshift Stories is released twice a month around the 1st and the 15th. This month's story was written by Alan V. Hare and read and recorded by Mitchell Too. Audio editing and post-production by Matthew Erdman. Opening and closing themes were composed and recorded by David Hume. To find out more about David, head over to davidhume.me. If you'd like to connect with us, please send an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com or visit our website at makeshiftstories.com. Links to both are in the show notes. You can help us out by getting your friends to subscribe wherever they listen to audio. Makeshift Stories is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution no derivative license, which means you are free to share our stories. Just remember to credit us and don't alter anything.